But if, I mean, who knows what's coming? But I know this, today, we're able to assemble freely. And we ought to take advantage of it. And like uh, Brother Jeremy prayed, we need to take advantage of that God gives us to be a light. Because there's plenty of, you know, if I'm thinking right, you know, let's put it like this. If I held up uh, a big lighter right now, and you'd see a little yellow flame, right? And, uh, but if you turned every light in this place off, boy, that same little light, it didn't get brighter, but it would shine a lot brighter, wouldn't it? And as it gets darker out there, it really ought to make it, just common sense, it ought to make it easy, easier for us, amen, to, to shine a little brighter, right? So we didn't kick it up a notch. I get the world just kicked it down off about 10. And that's just today. Tomorrow will be worse. <laughs> Count on it. Take your Bible this morning. Go to 2 Timothy. <coughs> 2 Timothy. I like to look at all this stuff. What is this? Oh, ooh, faith promise. I'm going to put that back. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 2. <laughs> And verse, uh, verse 15 should be a very, from, please, should be a very familiar verse. Um, it is to me. Uh, it says this, uh, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Uh, I'm a graduate of Charity Baptist Bible Institute, uh, founded by Dr. Estep and run by uh, brother uh, Dr. Mike Honstein, uh, until he went home to be with the Lord. And I was blessed uh, by being, uh, uh, I saved through the ministry of that church. And then, and then when I got out of jail, I went to that church. I got, ended up getting five years probation. I couldn't leave the state without a federal judge's permission. God called me to preach at the rescue mission in Columbus, Ohio. And, and, and here I find out the, the little church that I go to has a Bible, a very good Bible Institute that even Dr. Ruckman recommended. If you couldn't uh, come down to Pensacola, he recommended, it was advertised in the bulletin in the 80s to go to charity, take courses. At, and here I am, God just put me there. Didn't cost me a dime. All I had to do was show up. Amen. What a blessing. And uh, the flagship verse, for lack of a better way to put it, thank you. Um, this will be the first water I've had all week. Thank you, dear. All right, just a little, you know, just saying. <laughs> and uh, and uh, this is the verse that uh, the whole institute was built on because of its important. And I heard it early on, and, uh, and I 100% agree with it. And that's the key to understanding the Bible. And uh, so that's what we're going to look at. This morning, we're going to look at verse 15, go through it a little bit. I'm going to make my little, get my little two cents worth and, uh, and see if you, you can't get a blessing somewhere. Even if you know the material very well yourself. It's uh, just, we're going to revisit something that's important. That's what we need to do. All right, so let's pray again. Father, thank you for grace. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the freedom that we have. Uh, to assemble and given us this great place to assemble. Thank you for men and women that step up to the plate and, uh, and pastor churches and go to the mission field and all those things. They have my utmost respect. And uh, I pray now, God, you just uh, allow me to say something to be a help and blessing, minister to these folks, be uh, according to thy will. And I just thank you for saving a wretch like me. And I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. First of all, the verse says study. Study. I mean, we talk about read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible. The verse, that's not, and you ought to. But the verse says study. So I want to say study as opposed to just reading. Isaiah chapter 28. Go to Isaiah chapter 28. Yeah. Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 9. And the word of God says this. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk. And drawn from the breasts. Verse 10, for precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Here a little, there a little. You know what that is? That's study. That's study. That's not a proverb a day. I'm all for that. That really doesn't qualify 
and study in your Bible. Amen. Amen. Understanding doctrine. We live in a day and age where uh, uh, many people that profess to be Christians, I'm talking about would be the clergy, amen, uh, pastors, uh, uh, say, well, we don't, we, don't, we don't deal with doctrine. Doctrine is divisive. But, yeah, it's supposed to be. It, it separates the, the wheat from the tares, uh, the, the sheep from the, from the wolves. It'll weed out the goats, too. Amen. Uh, uh, so like I say, uh, 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 many of the clergy, I don't know where that word comes from. Uh, I, I wanted to get a little thicker for my car, you know, because you go to the hospital and there'll be, there'll be a, a reserved parking for clergy. And I wanted to get a little thing that said spurgy. <laughs> and I get you one that says sturgy. Yeah. Amen. And, uh, and I don't know if that worked. My kids. My kids, we, we had a Greyhound bus for the first, I don't know, six or seven years till that caught on fire. And, uh, and uh, that was either the devil or something stupid I did. We're not sure, but we never take the blame. <laughs> anyway, and, uh, and, uh, and my kids used to say, uh, we grew up in Spurgatory. Yeah, yeah. Five, five females and Dave Spurgeon in a Greyhound bus. That's like Spurgatory. But they got prayed out. They got married. Amen. Doctrine is important. Amen. Uh, it says in John chapter 5, John chapter 5, in verse 39, the Lord said, Search the scriptures. Amen. Uh, For in them ye think ye have eternal life, and, and they are they which testify of me. I, I'm talking about studying the Bible. You study the Bible. What you find out is you can know that you have uh, eternal life. First John chapter 5. Go ahead and go there. Because I don't want to be accused, you know, being done too fast. So there's a way. We got preachers. We got a way of dragging it out as long as you want. We'll just read every single verse. I don't care. Anyway, 1 John chapter 5. And I usually don't slow down enough to do that. But uh, uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. Uh, the Bible says this. Uh, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life. That you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Uh, I found out that I can believe on the Son of God. That Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That even included me. And you know what? When I did that, I found out that I have eternal life. Amen. There are people that say you can lose your salvation. I don't know what kind of uh, salvation they got, but I got the everlasting kind. It says everlasting. I looked it up. It means everlasting. That is so deep. This is so hard. Amen. Uh, I don't know about religion. I never had any. Don't have any now. But, uh, but I'll tell you what, Bible salvation is simple. It's simple. Amen. And so you study the Bible and you can know. And it says that. It says in Acts 17, you'll love this. In verse 11, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. How many know who he's talking about? Who are the these that are, that's being referred to. It was the Bereans. What an interesting name for a church. Somebody, oh, you already did that. Okay, good. That's a good name. And what were they known for? Searching the scriptures uh, daily. We should search the scriptures. Listen, the, Thess the Thessalonians had a great testimony for growth and giving. But credit is given here to the Bereans because of their relationship to the word of God. Word of God's important to God. And you know why Christians fall for uh, some of the stuff they fall for? I mean, I learned in Bible Institute uh, many years ago now that most of your cults and, and wackos uh, were started by uh, a haywire Baptist. Yeah, and they just get a hold of something. They don't have sound doctrine. And they, well, this probably means, you know, and, uh, and that's how a lot of them... A lot of the, uh, like, wacko, there's a difference between a wacko and, uh, and a cult. Uh, not a whole lot, but, uh, you know, there's heresy and damnable heresy. You understand what I'm saying? And the reason that that stuff uh, thrives and, and flourishes is because people aren't searching the scripture at all. Amen. And, you know, we're talking about a study, study to show thyself approved unto God. Only the King James Bible has the word study in the verse. Isn't that interesting? As important as it is to have this kind of relationship with your Bible, 
That's one of the first places the attack went when they started making the non, I, you know, I don't want to say perversions because that's so kind of harsh, but I guess it's too late now. So, so the new King James, the new American Standard, and the CSB, I had to look that up, the Christian Standard Bible. Amen. You ever, anybody got one? You can read it for me. Amen. I hope not. Uh, you know, it says, it says there, instead of study to show thyself, it says, be diligent. Well, I'm for being diligent, and, and it says that in other places, but that's not what our Bible says. That's not what the verse says. The, the New Living Translation, amen, uh, it says, work hard. Yeah, that's easier to understand. Study, work hard. Yeah, it is work sometimes, but uh, you know what the NIV says? Do we? I hope you don't. Uh, and the revised version, they say, they say, do your best. Do your best to be approved unto God. My Bible says in John chapter 14, and verse 26, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Listen, if your best, if doing your best would do the job, you would need the Holy Spirit teaching you or bringing all things to remembrance. You can handle it yourself. And uh, doing your best work, let's face it, you wouldn't even need God at all, would you? Yeah, yeah. But you do. Yeah. You do. It says this in 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know, him, know them, <clears throat> because they are spiritually discerned. We're kicking it around the, uh, one of these days, uh, last couple days. Uh, that's what the scholars do. That's what the intelligent people do. Uh, uh, some people are, well, it said profess themselves to be wise. They became fools. Uh, they'll read that Bible and they'll read that Bible and it doesn't make sense to them and they can't understand it. So they change it. Because they don't understand it, don't have the faith to believe it as it's written. They change it. And that's where all these other, other versions uh, come from. And the reason they don't understand it is because it's spiritually discerned. And God set it up that way. And you got to put enough faith in him to trust him for the forgiveness of your sin to get the key ingredient to understanding the Bible, which is the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Proverbs chapter 9, and verse 10, a familiar verse. The Bible says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Listen, folks, there's only one place knowledge of the holy comes from. And it ain't Google. Amen. And it ain't YouTube. Right. Amen. And it ain't, it ain't some, uh, uh, some commentary that you find in a, in a Christian bookstore written about a book. It is the book. Amen. Dr. Gipp used to say, uh, uh, quit, quit reading books about a book you're not reading. And I'm all for the helps. I've got all the commentaries, you know what I mean? And uh, I'm all for that. But they're helps. They're not replacements. All right, so knowledge of the holy comes from one place. Amen. Uh, uh, there's there's, uh, there's uh, knowledge of other things, but knowledge of the holy comes from the King James Bible. And uh, therefore, you'd do well to study this book. Number one in our, in our Sunday school lesson and this morning is uh, the word study. But then it says this. It says uh, to show thyself. A study to show thyself. Uh, I check, you know, if somebody, uh, uh, I, I don't know what, this doesn't happen very often, much don't seem like any more people will hand me a Bible and, and, uh, and uh, I've looked at a Bible in, uh, on a shelf and I just personally, for me, the default place I go is this verse right here, 2 Timothy 2, 15, because it says study to show and then and the word is spelled S-H-E-W. Now, I know preachers, uh, Christians, they'll pronounce it shoe. Uh, I, I don't do that. I wasn't taught to do that. I think it's show. It means show in the context. Um, but uh, you know what some of, the, some of the Bible printers will do, I guess, to help us, is they'll change the spelling to S-H-O-W. And they do that quite frequently. You say, well, is that a big deal? Well, for me, if, uh, if they think I need that kind of help, uh, what else have they changed? And you got to remember, the devil is subtle. Amen? So uh, uh, it says, study to show thyself. And, uh, and, and that's personal, see? 
It says in uh, Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, and, and, and take my yoke, you don't understand, Jesus speaking, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. <laughs> there you go. Uh, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Uh, this is personal. You're supposed to study for yourself. Uh, not so you'll get a big A on the test. Not so you'll be esteemed of others for how much you know. About the time you're getting puffed up with your knowledge, uh, God will bring somebody in that knows more than you. And I got news for you. There's always somebody that knows more than you. Amen. Amen. So uh, the Bible says uh, honor before honor is humility. <laughs> And uh, amen. So to get closer to the Lord, it says you're supposed to draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to us. Is that what it says? No. It says draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. See, here's what we miss. We, you know, we make, we make everything corporate like the Bible is addressed. No, man, this book is personal. He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Uh, up in Blessed Hope, up in Coon Rapids, I saw this first time I ever went in there. You go into the bathroom, and next to the sink it says, Cleanse your hands, you sinners. And, and I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> Bible says in uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Amen. Amen. Now you may prove what has that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Uh, either you get conformed to this wor word, or you have no choice but to be conformed to the world. This book will transform your mind. Amen. Say, how do you know, Brother Spurgeon? Well, duh. Amen? <laughs> Transforming your mind is personal, too. Like salvation. It says in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 15, Med Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear unto all. Uh, you get your mind transformed, you start thinking different, you'll start acting different. People will see that. Uh, like we said last yesterday, many shall see it. Oh, yeah, many shall see it in fear. Trust in the Lord. We got to give them something to see. And there he gives you an, a key ingredient to that, meditating on the Word of God. Give thyself holy. There's more to being a King James Bible believer than just waving this thing around and bless God, I've got the inspired in there. And, and you do. But uh, it does say in Psalm 119 to hide it in your heart. And uh, I know some Christians, they got it under their arm. They need to move it over. We need to become more than just Bible believers. We need to become Bible practicers. Amen. Amen. And you can't practice it if you don't know what's in there. That's right. Amen. All right. It says in uh, Titus chapter 2 and verse number 7. Go ahead and go there. Because Titus chapter 2 and verse 7, what a chapter, man. What a chapter about the responsibility of the mature Christian to the, in regard to the younger. The aged men, the aged women. I don't think that means uh, chronologically age. I think it has to do with your experience in the Word of God. Amen. If you've been in the Word of God for a while, you've got something you can help somebody else with. Amen. You can be a 35-year-old woman and have some, enough sense to help a 20-year-old girl that just got saved, wouldn't you? Oh, is that, well, I'd like to help her, but i got to wait until I'm 60. Duh. <laughs> Verse number seven. In all things, showing thyself, there's that word again, showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine, uh, uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, uh, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Somebody said one time, Brother Spurgeon, they're saying they're telling lies about you over at this church. I said, well, at least they're not telling the truth. <laughs> you may, if somebody's talking bad about you, make sure it's not the truth. Amen. You can't control what other people say. You can't control what other people post. Just make sure it's not true. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And if it is, get it right. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So it says study, and that's, uh, it means uh, study. <laughs> and it and said, uh, uh, to show thyself, this is you. Uh, you need to study. My wife's a better studier than I am. But, uh, you know, I wish that would work, you know, because we have a big studier in our house. But I guess there's some responsibility on me, too. And so it is with you. All right? And then it said, approved unto God. Now, that ought to be really important to you. You ought to want to be uh, really, uh, uh, you ought to want to be approved unto God. It says in 1 Samuel 15, go there. 
1 Samuel 15. And here's how you uh, show that self approved unto God. 1 Samuel 15 and verse 22. Now here you got Samuel uh, seriously rebuking Saul for tweaking it, you know, like, uh, you know, the Lord said do this. And say, oh, yeah, well, I just figured that's the problem, man. Things haven't changed much. Saul was an independent Baptist, I can tell. Amen. First Samuel chapter 15, verse 22, and Samuel said, hath, hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Question mark. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. Amen. Uh, listen, uh, we live in a day and age, and maybe it's always been this way with human beings, for all I know, but uh, we kind of got a mantra that we live by the end justifies the means. And so we, whatever we do to get the result, if it's the right result, but that totally doesn't apply with God. The end does not justify the means. The end never justifies the means. God is interested in the means. He's in charge of the end. He's in charge of the result. God gives the increase. What he's really interested in is if people, amen, will submit by faith to doing it his way. Amen. And if we will, he gets glory, more glory, and we think, well, what have we got to do to get people saved? Well, how about if we just be faithful to commit the truth, the word of God, sow the seed, water the seed, and trust God for the increase? wonder what would happen if we ever started doing that. Amen. i tell you what, I think that maybe some people that aren't really saved might, you know, I think people have been led to the Lord on door to door in different places that I've been just to get the preacher off the porch. I've seen it. I was with a church in North Carolina once, and that meeting ended on Wednesday. And, uh, and we were still uh, around, and they did visitation on Thursday. They had a section of town, a bad, rough section of town, all trailers, uh, all people that spoke other languages. And, uh, and, uh, and they don't go there. They don't go there, and, uh, but they got a Marine chief warrant officer in their church, and he's a good man, and he don't care. But, you know, nobody's going to go with him in that neighborhood. So I said, well, you know, we're around. We're parked in the parking lot. I said, you know. And they said, oh, Brother Spurgeon and that guy. And we went. We went. I don't care. I mean, that's the kind of place that I lived before God saved me. I mean, I'm not worried about it. But uh, here we are standing on the front door of this trailer with a white shirt tie on. We look like feds. No wonder nobody wanted to open the door. Finally, we're knocking, and the guy's not taking over an answer. We know there's people inside, and we can hear them hiding the drugs and the guns. And, uh, and finally, the door opened about this far, and this lady peeked out, and, she's, and they, here this soul winner, he went out and, hello, we're here from blah, 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 Baptist Church, and we're here to tell you about Jesus Christ. And, and the man, he had a sales pitch. It was good. If he was selling cards, I'd have bought one. And, uh, and uh, the lady, you can tell, and she's got a nervous look, and she's looking back into the house, and I'm standing back going, this doesn't look good here. Amen. Finally, a guy comes to the door, long hair, and, uh, and, uh, and he doesn't speak English very good, and the soul winner man, he goes after him. And next thing you know, this guy's looking out, looking up down the street to see if anybody sees us on the car. Come in, come in, just to get us out. Long story short, we're at the uh, kitchen table, got about three women, got candles everywhere, got Mary, got all this stuff. And we're standing there with two guys who don't speak English very good. And uh, he's saying, uh, well, you know, uh, Jesus Christ went to the cross for you and all that. And they're like, you know, trying to figure out how to get us out of the house and looking around, and I'm getting back up against the wall because I've been in places like this before, and, uh, and I'm waiting for the AK-47s to come out. And finally, this guy said, you know, you want to pray? And they're going, no, no, no. And he said, what's the matter? You don't love Jesus? You don't care? Jesus died for you. And I'm thinking, okay, that's it. You just insulted him now. And uh, he said, you need to pray. And I said, okay. And boy, they bowed their head, and he led them in a little prayer and couldn't get us out of the door fast enough. And I'm going, whoa, that's a different school I was raised in. We get back to the church, and all the soul winners come back from their duty, you know, because there's donuts and stuff. And, uh, and bragging on them, yes, we went into the heart of the ghetto and, and uh, led these two guys to the Lord. 
And it was all for bragging rights. God wasn't within a million miles of that thing. Amen. Well, in my opinion. So if it's just words, maybe they got it. But I know they didn't get it. And you know they didn't get it too. And we got to do things God's way. And with, God doesn't even need us if that works. That's right. Here's the God's way. It says in... Uh, Hebrews 13 and verse 15, by him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. Brother, I've been wondering when we're going to get kumbaya on this screen. I've been sitting here for, but no, the sacrifice of praise. But so what is that? Is it a power team, a praise team? Is it a light show? And oh yeah, I preached in upstate New York and there's a lady that came uh, during the revival because her son went to that church, but, uh, but uh, she couldn't come on Sunday because she was in charge of the lights. I'm not even sure what that means, but I don't, I, and I don't know if they had a smoke machine. I'm not sure what's going on. Amen. But uh, that's not what it says when it, that's not what it means when it says offer the sacrifice of praise continually. It, it's defined in the verse. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Sacrifice of praise is true, sincere gratitude for what Jesus Christ did. Amen. <laughs> and if you get a hold of that, it will change your life. You won't need to be hammered on how to live the Christian life. Gratitude will help you live the Christian life. It'll, be bo you'll, it'll bother you to find out that there's behavior in your life that isn't pleasing to God. How many things had you mature as a Christian? I, there are things, oh, we're not supposed to do. I didn't know. How would you know? That's what growing in grace is about. That's what maturing is about. You want to be, if you don't care if you're approved unto God or not, you're stupid or lost. But if you are, you ought to want to be. Pleasing to the one that went to the went so far for you. It says in the next verse in Hebrews 13 and verse 16 says, but to do good and to communicate, forget not for with such sacrifices. God is well pleased. You want to be approved unto God? There's a formula for it. Uh, I read that thing. Now I heard this early on. Uh, in preaching uh, that uh, you could hear, well done, now good and faithful servant. And that would blow my mind. I'm thinking, are you kidding somebody like me? I mean, come out of the dregs of the, I don't know, everything. And, uh, but I can, I'm glad to be saved. I'm glad I'm not going to hell. But it's possible to live in such a way that the Lord Jesus Christ could say, well done. How many would like to hear that from the Lord? Amen you know, when you get on the other side. And, uh, and uh, but then I got the reading over here and it says, uh, but to do good and to communicate, forget not for such sacrifices, God is well pleased. And I went, well pleased. And I went back to Matthew chapter uh, three and it says in verse 17, and low a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I mean, it's possible that the Lord could say the same thing about you or me that he said about Jesus Christ when he baptized them. I don't know about you, man, that kind of, that's mind-blowing to me. Amen. If that's within reach, I mean, we ought to be reaching for it. Amen. Yeah, say, well, you know, sometimes we fail. <laughs> yeah, that's, well, that's because we're human. But don't fail to try, and don't fail to get back up, get right and get back up when you do fail. Amen. 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 We're talking about studying to show that self approved unto God. It says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. Nope, that's Philippians 3. Uh, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that to present, present, remember that? Present arms. That's a voluntary show of respect that you present uh, your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your. Reasonable, not meritorious, not above and beyond the call of duty. Buddy, for what Jesus Christ did for us, it is reasonable for us to submit, to surrender, to serve him. We ought to want to be, we ought to desire to be approved unto God. Listen, if only the verse you know is John 3, 16, and, and the only Bible story you know is David and Goliath, and somebody told you how to be saved, and you had enough sense to admit you are a sinner, and you trusted in the shed blood of Jesus Christ to wash away your sin, man. Your book goes in the book of life. He didn't make it hard. He made it easy. But if you stay right there, 
Boy, you don't even know you're supposed to be approved. You don't even have a clue. Listen, there's so much more to the Christian life. And again, to be the vessel that we're supposed to be, the light in a dark world, we need to study this Bible. Yes. Study to show they tell approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Workman. <laughs> Jack Wood said one time, said, I don't believe God would save a lazy man. Amen. Well, he did. Amen. Hopefully I'm not as lazy as I was. was. But it says work, but not lazy, man. Amen. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and in verse 12 says, And further by these, my son, be admonished of making many books. Uh, be admonished of making many books. There is no end. Boy, I got a library. I got a library at my house. I mean, I got nice bookshelves. I've got how many books are in my office? You know, not as many as in yours, but there's a lot. <laughs> when Brother Heinstein died, I inherited his wife, his kids, his friends, amen, his library. I got all these books. I got all these books. Some preachers at my house one time. They're impressed. They're impressed. They say, Brother Spurgeon, you've got a good collection of books. And I said, thank you, thank you. And he said, have you read all these? And I looked down and I said, read them? I thought we were just supposed to collect them. <laughs> I don't ask for looks. I read them. I'm busy reading this one. Amen. Amen. It says, uh, of making many books, there's no end. And then it says, that, and much study is a weariness of the flesh, which is why we don't. It's weary. My wife is bookish. She reads all the time. She reads everything. I, I wish I was more like that. Amen. I had to give up a lot of habits when I got saved. If I was a reader, I wouldn't have had to give that up. I'd have just had to change curriculum. But uh, she studies. To me, it's weary. I'm a preacher. I know I'm supposed to study. I preach on studying. I got, a, I got an office when I'm not traveling, which isn't much. But uh, I got an office, nice office, like I said. And I got a nice desk. And, uh, and I'll be studying. Okay, God will give me thoughts. He gives me all kinds of thoughts. And... Uh, and uh, I'll be studying, and it's like, and I, and I hear this voice, you know, or, or something. I hear this, and I get up, I walk about six feet to the garage, and I open the door. And there's my motorcycle, and there's my toolbox, and there's, and it's like, I, I mean, when I try, I mean, intentionally, uh, try to sit down to study the Word of God, and something just draws me to the garage. That's work more physical, uh, but uh, that's easier for some of us. And if it comes easy, great. If it doesn't, do it anyway. That's why they call it work anyway. It may be weariness to the flesh, but it isn't to the spirit. Right. Psalm 1 and verse 2 says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Who? Who he? Uh, well, it says, uh, it, well, it's the blessed man of verse 1. Uh, blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Amen. Well, that's the temptation. Uh, but it says uh, how to prevent that. Your, make your delight the law of the Lord. Get in the book. Study the book. Be a workman. Amen. And uh, that means uh, studying the Bible is a good way to keep the flesh in subjection. Amen. Paul said it like this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I preach to others, I myself... Should be a castaway. If a preacher's got to keep his guard up against that, don't you think you do too? Amen. And that strengthens the Spirit of God inside of you. That book says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, for the flesh lusts against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh, and they are contrary one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Now, we know the flesh fights. I guess sometimes we forget that the Spirit's supposed to be fighting back. Yeah, right. Amen. And so it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished Amen. unto all good works. Amen. Uh, I mean, maybe if it comes easy, good. If it doesn't, work at it. Amen. But it'll be help you if you do. It says it needeth not to be ashamed. Uh, it says this in Romans chapter 10 and verse 11, for the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him should not be ashamed. That's why we tell people when you get saved, best thing you can do is go tell somebody. It kind of helps seal it. 
you know. And uh, and uh, I've been uh, I've been uh, uh, I believe in that for a long time. And that you need to tell somebody. I believe if you can, you'd write the date you got saved in your Bible. When the devil comes by and says, you're not saved, you wouldn't have thought that, you wouldn't have done that. Say, yes, I am, right here. It says right here, I got saved that day. <laughs> Amen. And uh, uh, let me tell you something. 500 years ago, roughly, we've had our Bible a little over 400 years. 500 years ago, uh, there for that century, uh, uh, people were burned at the stake. For what? For the word of God, for concealing. Uh, during the process of God assembling what we have as the King James Bible, uh, portions of scripture were translated, concealed, and being assembled, and people were caught with them, and they were burned at the stake, and they were executed. Amen? Amen. Uh, the, the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8 was reading uh, Isaiah 53 in, in a foreign language. Don't you think he had to work at that? Amen? Uh, missionaries, I heard some missionaries in the Ukraine were over there, uh, uh, and they were handing out Bibles. And they're in Kiev, and, uh, and they're handing out, they got Bibles for everybody. New, it might have been New Testaments, so they're handing them out. They got a big crowd, and they're handing them out. And some guy there with a family group, about 10 or 12 people, and he would be, he'd be the one, he'd reach in and get a Bible, and he'd tear a page out, and he'd give it to, and he'd tear a page out, and he's giving pages of the Bible to all his relatives, and the missionaries going, What are you doing, man? You're ripping pages out of the Word of God. And the guy said to him, to the interpreter, we have been in darkness for so long, none of us have ever even seen a single page of the word of God. And boy, he is going to make sure that all his family went home with something. He said, no, you don't have to do that. We got a Bible for everybody. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. We've got it in abundance in our own language and don't read it like we should, let alone study it. It says this, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1, And I, brethren, could not speak uh, unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are ye able. It's crying shame that a lot of Christians, and I'm not talking about all them other crowds, I'm talking about people in our crowd that have been told and taught that the King James Bible is the word of God, but they're still at the milk stage. Why? Because they don't hide it in their heart. They don't hide it in their heart. Paul said this uh, in Romans 1 and 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Amen. Now, when I first read that, when I first got a hold of that, and I've been in church a little while, like a year or two, before I zeroed in on that thing. But when I was in motorcycle gangs, I had it, uh, I wore their colors, and I got it tattooed on my back, and everything I knew revolved around that motorcycle and around the club. In other words, I was not ashamed to let people know what I loved, what I was willing to l live for, and die for. And then I got saved. And I read that verse, and I thought, what a, what, how ludicrous would it be to now be ashamed of the gospel of Christ considering what he went? Amen. And I got a hold of that thing. Amen. And I'm going to tell you something. People aren't ashamed one bit about to tell you what they love. Amen? Amen. Uh, just go to Walmart, and instead of driving around using a half a tank of gas to get a spot by the door, <laughs> park out in the middle of the parking lot and walk up to the door and when you walk up there, you read the bumper stickers on cars. And you look at the hats and t-shirts of people coming out of the store. And they might be talking about ball teams or whatever else, but I'm here to tell you this, people are not ashamed to let you know what they care about, what they love. What a crying shame. We don't need any closet Christians. We don't need any, any undercover agents. We need to be like Paul and live it 24-7. He said, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Amen. I'm going to say this and move on. Most American Christians ought to be ashamed for not spending more time in their Bible. Amen. You're welcome. And then the verse finishes with these words, rightly dividing the word of truth, rightly dividing. Uh, it says in 2 uh, Timothy, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 1, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry... Paul writing, uh, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced 
the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Sometimes we need to remember we are in the sight of God. Listen, we need to rightly divide the word of truth so that we don't handle it deceitfully. The rules, I was, learned, I was taught early on, the rules of rightly dividing. You'll determine who's talking. Then you determine who he's talking to. Then you look at what they're saying. We do it opposite. Oh, it says this, so therefore, no, no, no. You've, who's talking, who they're talking to, and then what they're saying. A good example is Acts 238. Boy, what a mess. I was in a, I was in a Wendy's drive through in uh, Pahokee, Florida, down there with Ted Hines. Some of you might know who he is. And, uh, and uh, Sunday afternoon, and we're going out to eat, man. And I'm going to tell you what, when you're in Pahokee, Florida, going to Wendy's drive through is the best shot in town. Oh, yeah, we're out there. And uh, so I'm in, uh, I got, you know, probably uh, Act 1631, Magnet on the back of the car then. And, uh, and I mean, three cars back, this Sunday afternoon, somebody gets out of their car, three cars back, runs up the line. I see them coming because I'm watching everything all the time. And runs up uh, next to my car and says, Act 238, Act 238. And turns around and runs back and I'm going, what was that? What was the purpose of that? Well, if you do any study and ask your preacher, there's a lot of false doctrine built around that verse. The verse says this, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And uh, Peter is an apostle to the Jews. That's who's talking. He's talking to the Jews assembled at Jerusalem. And what he's saying is for them Jews. And it doesn't have anything to do with a Gentile saved by grace through faith. Amen. But I guess if you don't rightly divide, you don't know that. If you don't rightly divide, you connect uh, uh, baptism with salvation. Uh, uh, if you don't rightly divide, you'll be like a Seventh-day Adventist that says, that Bible says keep the Sabbath, and that's Saturday. And so they're against what we're doing here today. Amen. But this, that was under the Old Testament law for the Jew. Amen. Amen. I, I, here's what I look at. Let's just make it real simple. If you don't rightly divide... And I know brethren that are, I mean, like-minded in so many ways that don't believe in dispensationalism, things like that. It, to me, that's what makes it make sense. Yes. Amen. And I still love them. I'm not breaking fellowship with them. But I'm thinking, if you don't rightly divide, you'll wrongly divide. Amen. You know, this sentence always got me. Uh, the Old Testament saints, people believe Old Testament saints were saved looking forward to the cross. You ever heard that? Okay, so Jesus told him that he was going to be crucified and that he was going to rise on the third day. And there wasn't one Old Testament saint there. Now, does that strike anybody but me? If they were looking for it, he told the disciples that and they didn't even believe him. Yeah. Looking forward to the cross. They don't to this day believe Isaiah 53 is for them. All right, moving on. All right, so wrongly dividing the Bible is not a good thing. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 16 says, As also in all his epistles, speaking in, the, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, uh, which, they, which they are, yeah, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as as they do also the other scriptures, it says, unto their own destruction. Amen. If you don't rightly divide, you're hurting yourself. Rightly dividing the word of truth. John 17, 17 says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Some things are fun to study. History, some people like history. Uh, let me tell you something. History, if, if I, I'll say almost. Uh, maybe I should say always. History is almost always written from the from the uh, view of the uh, uh, the viewpoint of the author. I've read stuff on the Civil War. I'm a Tennessean by birth, and I was raised in Ohio, so I got dual citizenship. <laughs> Amen. Thank God for it. And uh, and uh, I've read books on the Civil War ret written from a Northern historian's viewpoint, and it's saying things about the South that I know aren't true, and I've read it the other way, 
And, you know, you pick up a book and you read it, and all of a sudden you're looking at it like the Bible. This is true. And now we take that from an article on the Internet. Well, it's edited on the Internet, therefore. I mean, you better be careful about that. Uh, we're talking about, uh, we're talking about uh, studying the truth, rightly dividing the word of, of truth. Amen. Isn't it funny that conspiracy theorists are, I'm going to say always again because I'm nicer than I was last time, are almost always kooks. But they're well-read kooks. I told a guy in New York, I said, wow, you know a lot about that, don't you? He goes, well, it's documented. It's documented, Russ Burge. You can read it yourself. I said, wow, if I knew my Bible as good as you know all that junk, I'd be a better preacher. <laughs> he got the drift, and he, went, he kind of shut up, and I said, and if you knew your Bible as much as you know all that stuff, you'd be a better Christian. That's right. Yeah. I'm going to tell you what. We need, hey, listen, it's okay to have other interests, but you better keep the main thing the main thing. Amen. Amen. Study yourself thyself approved unto God. Uh, the New Testament believers commanded. Study is uh, the, the, the subject is implied. It's not a suggestion. He doesn't write, I beseech you, be therefore, brethren. No, it's a command. Study to show thyself approved unto God. We're supposed to study it. And you ought to want to, in light of this fact, John 8, verse 32 says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. Freedom's an important deal to me. Amen. As an American, I'm a veteran. I believe in it. I come from a long line of veterans, uh, people that have fought for it. And, uh, and then on a more personal uh, level, uh, I've been in the back of a cop car handcuffed. I've been locked up. And freedom's important. And that book says the truth should make you free. And uh, it's worth studying, isn't it? Father, thank you for this hour and letting it, uh, let me get done in time. And pray God you might take some of it and use it for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name I pray.